Good afternoon, good evening, good morning to all of uh, our listeners out there. It is uh, 1 p.m. in Bangkok, so it's good afternoon from us. Thank you for joining us for uh, the third session for today's uh, SpapaCon. This is session 2-3, uh, and we will be listening about the archaeology of Cambodia, of Thailand, and of Myanmar this afternoon. Um, so thank you all for, for uh, joining us this afternoon. Uh, just a reminder for any of you who are just joining us and, and um, that you can leave your questions on the Q&A box in Zoom. And if you're joining us on Facebook, you can just leave a question in the comments and we'll transfer that question into the question box in Zoom. Uh, yeah, so today we have, uh, this afternoon, we have four speakers. Uh, each speaker gets about 40, about 20 minutes to, to speak, and then we will go on to our question and answer session after that. So without much further ado, let me introduce our first speakers for this afternoon's session, uh, Yuni Sato and uh, Tomomi Tamura, who are from the Nara National Research Center, uh, uh, National Research Institute for Cultural Properties in Japan. Uh, and they're going to be talking about um, the uh, Western Prasad Top Sanctuary in uh, Cambodia, in Hong Kong. Uh, Uni has been uh, working on the restoration work at Western Prasad Top since 2008, and uh, Tomomi is uh, a specialist in ancient glass beads in Southeast Asia. So without much further ado, may I invite uh, Uni and uh, Tamura to, to uh, please take the floor. Thanks, Noel. Can you see this screen? Yes, we can see it. Okay. So thank you. And thank you to Simil Spapa for providing us a chance to talk. I'm Yumi Sato from Nara, Research, Nara National Research Institute for Cultural Properties, Japan. And today I and Ms. Tamura will talk about our recent research on the, the Western Prasad Top in Angkor Thom. So today, uh, I after I introduce the outline of our research at the Western Prasad Top, I will talk about the excavation of uh, Northern Sanctuary, and then Miss Tamura will present the scientific analysis result on the artifacts, especially glass, and then we will conclude the, our presentation. So most of you know well about the uncle. Uh, here is the uh, uncle Tom and this square, uh, this square shaped embankment is uncle Tom and which built, was built, built by the Jehovah Man the Sevens and Western Plaza top is located in the south, Southwest quadrant of uncle Tom. And research and restoration project is done by my institute, Nara National Research Institute for Cultural Properties and the Cambodian government, Apsara National Authority. And our institute started our research project of Western Prasad Top in 2002. This is the Prasad Top uh, viewing from the front. It means the east from the east. This is the central sanctuary, and here is the southern sanctuary, and this is north sanctuary. And in front of the central sanctuary, uh, you can see this uh, terrace. Uh, this is Uposatagara or so-called Buddhist terrace. I just mentioned the name Uposatagara or the Buddhist terrace. This remain is the one of the key factor of Theravada Buddhist complex in Angkor. Uh, this slide shows the model of Buddhist terrace. Uh, for example, uh, here is A is Prasad, and B is the pedestal of Buddha statues, and C is the Buddhist terrace, and this D, uh, they are surrounded by the eight Sima stones. In fact, the plan of Prasad Top is completely matched with 
this Theravada Buddhist terrace. Uh, in front of uh, this prasad, there is the uh, Buddhist pedestal. And this pedestal is on the Buddhist terrace. And then this laterite boundary and eight sea stones uh, surround it, is surround, uh, uh, are surrounding all of the monuments of this temple. Here is the previous studies uh, regarding the Prasad top. And then thanks to the FAO, we can see the situation in the early 20th century. It seems that the, uh, this is the situation when uh, almost when the Prasad top was discovered. And here is the, um, the during the clearance, uh, they found lots of beautiful sculptures like here, and then they are a part of the pediment, like this. We have opened the several trenches at Plaza Top, but today I quickly introduced the excavation of the Buddhist terrace. Uh, this yellow part shows the area where we excavated. At the trench, we found lots of artifacts. For example, the, uh, this ritual pot, and it contains gold, silver, bronze, and ruby inside. And also we found many brown glazed roof tile like this at the both sides of the uh, Buddhist terrace here. And from the same layer of that, those artifacts, we found several Buddhist statues, sculptures uh, like this, uh, like this. And I would like to move on the next topic, uh, Northern Sanctuary. As you can see, the before the restoration, uh, the situation of the Northern Sanctuary was quite severe. It's almost collapsed. However, no sanctuary was successfully restored by our Cambodian colleagues in the completed in 2018. And then the, here is the west face of the uh, post door. After the restoration, uh, this standing Buddha image was uh, successfully restored. And uh, this is the old photograph by Eiffel in early 20th century. Here is the south face. However, north face was the severely collapsed. Uh, although there is no old photo, also there is no old photo of the northern space, probably uh, when French team investigated here in early 20th century, uh, this northern face was already collapsed, so there is no archives by FAO, we guessed. However, finally we could uh, restore it. And this is the Buddha image on the north face. Uh, we can say surprisingly, this uh, reconstructed Buddha image shows the si quite similar style with so-called walking Buddha. Uh, this image is quite unique in Angkor area. As you know, walking Buddha style was popular during the Skotai period. It will be quite important to compare the iconography uh, with Skotai or Thailand and in Angkor. And during the restoration of the North Sanctuary, uh, we discovered the underground brick chamber just underneath of this uh, North Sanctuary uh, here. We set the excavation trench at the lower base of the North Sanctuary and to confirm the inner soil condition here. As a result, we could confirm the brick line here uh, around the ground level, level. This is the, uh, mm, the brick structure. 
Uh, this photo shows the lowest layer of the base uh, viewing from above. And you can see the square shaped uh, brick structure in the center here. And then we excavated uh, this um, inner part of this brick structure. And this is the after excavation. It measures about 2.1 meter, 2.1 meter and 1.5 meter depth. Uh, this shows the excavation station by our Cambodian colleagues. And this is the SFM image of the eastern wall. And you can see the remains of the carbonized part in the very bottom of the wall. And uh, this is the floor. Floor also uh, suited or block, uh, blackened. However, as you can see the upper part of the wall, this part is not carbonized or suited. So that the, uh, we guess that the, this chamber uh, was not fired for a long time, we guess. And here uh, we found a lot of artifacts and charcoal fragments just above the floor. And here is the artifacts from the uh, bottom layer. Uh, we found the gold, gold, bronze, crystals, and blue colored glass and glass beads and pieces of bones. And almost uh, all of the artifacts are very tiny, small size. And also the, all of the artifacts are mostly burnt. And then, And from this part of uh, speaker change, I'm uh, Tomomi Tamura, and I will talk about scientific analysis of unearthed glass beads. Uh, we examined glass fragments and glass beads from Western Prasa top. The glass fragments, number 17, are deep blue transparent. The small glass beads, BW71 and BW72, heavily weathered, but they are originally translucent white in color. These small glass beads are made with winding method. We conducted chemical analysis on one of the fragments and two small beads to identify the compositional type and colorant of glass. <coughs> chemical composition was analyzed by energy dispersive X-ray fluorescence spectrometer. The measurement was performed after removing the weather layer on the glass surface using an ultrasonic grinder. The measurement conditions and quantification accuracy are shown here. This is the results. The chemical compositions by X-ray fluorescence analysis are shown here. As a result of analysis, blue glass is soda glass. On the other hand, the two glass bees were both Potash lead glass. Potash lead glass is relatively new glass that was invented in China and appeared in the Song Dynasty in, uh, at the latest. Potash lead glass is known in Southeast Asia as a material for Chinese coil bees and its distribution volume increased in the late Song Dynasty, surpassing in the Pacific bees in numbers after the 13th century. Let us consider a little more about the compositional characteristics of blue glass. We compared with the composition of soda glass that was distributed in Japan from the third century BCE to the seventh century CE. Soda glass at this time is classified into five groups according to the chemical composition that reflect the difference in the place of production. The blue glass of Western Plaza top has a relatively high amount of uh, alumina, high amount of alumina and low amount of calcium, and it's presumed to carry on the tradition of Indian Southeast Asian type of glass. 
that existed、uh, since BC, such as Group S2B or MNA or MNAAL type of soda glass in the previous studies. In addition, we would like to discuss the coloring agent of this blue glass. This blue glass is colored by cobalt. And it is noteworthy that arsenic is detected in addition to cobalt in this blue glass. And the coloring agent, that is cobalt raw material, is different from the ancient one. Since sulfur was also detected, it is presumed that cobalt ore, such as cobaltite, is probably used as the cobalt raw material. Cobalt raw materials containing arsenic are not used in ancient glass. For ancient glass in Southeast Asia, a cobalt raw material with a large amount of manganese. Or a cobalt raw material with a slight amount of copper and lead as used. The former is thought to be mineral like ascolite, but the specific minerals for the latter are not known. On the other hand, in the medieval Western world, cobaltite was commonly used as a coloring agent. In this connection, the dark blue Bohemian glass beaker found in Japan with a signature of 1599 is colored with cobalt containing arsenic. But this Bohemian glass beaker is made of potash lime glass that is completely different from blue glass of Western plus at all. So in Southeast Asia, it is Possible that cobaltite came to be used as a coloring agent sometime after the 8th century. It is possible that the blue glass from Western Plaza Top was made of Southeast Asian glass with a cobalt colorant obtained from the Western world. Finally, we will discuss、uh, the origin of potash lead glass、uh, with a lead isotope operation analysis. As I mentioned before, potash lead glass is relatively new glass that was invented in China and appeared in the Sun Dynasty at the latest. The results of lead isotope analysis show that they have, heavier,、uh, they have very similar lead isotope ratios to each other, but they differ from those of lead ore, ingots, and bronze products from Southeast Asia. Compared with the Chinese mining data, There are mines with similar lead isotope ratios in the lower and upper Yangtze River Basin, region E and I, to those of glass beads from Western Plaza Top. Furthermore, although not completely in correspondence, it is possible that there are mines with similar lead isotope ratios in the Jianan, region F, Middle Yangtze River Basin, region Z, and the Linan, region H. In particular, the existence of mines with similar lead ice operation in the lower reaches of the Yanchi River is notable because it is consistent with the description, the customs of Cambodia, that the beads imported from Guangzhou or Chuzhou in China were desired in Chenla. And regarding the burnt bones, the five pieces of the burnt bones were analyzed and based on the histomorphological method.、Uh, the result of the closest species of the bone、uh, is thought to be the human beings. Also, we have conducted the AMS analysis, and the results showed that this date, the end of the 14th century to the early 15th century, I know that there are several hypotheses regarding the end of the uncle,、uh, but the, if the royal,、uh, also the royal chronicle is in perfect historical document,、uh, however,、uh, probably this AMS data、uh, insists that the,、uh, the dating of the brick chamber is very close to the end of the uncle empire. So, Sum up.、Uh, this is the first case that the underground chamber、uh, with charcoal and fired remains was discovered from beneath the sanctuary in Angkor. Also, there are also burnt gold artifacts, crystals, glass, and burnt bones were found. 
However, uh, it is not the situation that the chamber and artifacts were repeatedly exposed to heat for a long period. Judging from the AMS result, it can be dated to the end of 14th and to the former half of 15th century. So this, uh, it is assumed that the, probably uh, fire ritual activities uh, might have been conducted at this brick chamber of Western Prasato. So this is our end of the presentation. And in the last, um, unfortunately, um, Mr. Sokyo Sobanara has passed away uh, on the September 24th, uh, 2021. So we pray for the uh, repose of the soul of Sobanara. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Yuni. Thank you for your presentation. I, I must say that it is, it is, uh, it would not be a Southeast Asian archaeology conference if we did not visit Angkor at least once. And we also remember. Uh, thank you for uh, letting us remember Sophia Sawanara, who passed away this year. Um, with that, we go back in time to prehistoric Cambodia, and we invite our next speaker, uh, Valerie Zetun who will talk to us about the, the long running project in the funeral cave of Lang Spien in Batambang. Valerie, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you. So I'm sharing my, my screen, okay? Yes, go ahead. Is it okay for everyone? Yes, it is perfect. Okay, let's go. Um, so hello everyone. Thank you for your welcome to the member of the SPAFA. And today, I'm going to introduce you to the Langspin site on behalf of our colleagues, Hank Sopadi and Hubert Forestier, as well as our in entire team. The Langspin site is located in the west of Cambodia in the province of Batambang. It is the main cave of a karst massif that appears in the landscape as a Phnom that is a limestone rock mass that points into the plain landscape. The site was formed in the 60s by Cécile and Roland Mourer, who were teachers in Batambang. The site was excavated from 64 with the help of a team of young Cambodians. The long spin site is known as a regional benchmark for the Oabinian and for the Neolithic. Uniface were found as well as footed vessels. The first radiocarbon dates have been proposed for the upper level of the first chamber. These remains have contributed to write the beginning of the prehistory of Cambodia. Unfortunately, due to local events, the excavation had to be stopped in, in, in uh, 70 when the Khmer Rouge conquered the country. For many years, nothing was possible and the demilitarization of the area did not start until 1991. Even today, a large number of dangerous weapons are found in the cave and in the ground. Many minefields still exist around the cave. However, in 2009, a new collaboration was set up between Anxopadi and Hubert Forestier and excavations were restarted to serve as a training site for young Cambodian students. Since 2009, many results have been produced. Thus, it, is, it was possible to identify a Wabinian level with many faunal remains and lithic tools with dates between 11,000 and 5,000 year BP. The finds of lithic material and the technological analysis that has been carried out are allow a new definition of the Oabinian. As you can see here, there is a, some step of shaping, but also debitage and shaping. And after that, or in the same time, shaping and debitage. In addition, a long occupation, a long sequ sequence of occupation was uncovered. Tools 
older than 7 1,000 year BP have been formed and the upper Neolithic levels have yielded ceramic remains that complement those formed by the mural in the 60s. What about human bones? Between 64 and 70, the mural has collected a few isolated human bone fragments. Before I tell you about them, let's see where some known burial sites are in Cambodia. First of all, there is the famous Neolithic site of Samrong Sen on the shores of Tonglek Sep Lake. This is one of the earliest known prehistoric sites in Southeast Asia. Its material was studied by Emil Kartayak in 1877. The Samrong Sen site yelled 20 human skeletons and benefited from one of the first radiocarbon dating in 69. This means an age of 3,230 years BP, which was clarified in 2002 by Livana, with a dating of 3,995 years BP. Another example of a Cambodian funerary archaeological site is the Phnom Sinai site, excavated by Kate Domet and Dougal O'Reilly, and was which was dated to 2,350 years BP. At prayer, some richly underworld burials have been dated to 2,400 years BP by the team of Andreas Reineke and Hank Sopen. The Cocteria site was the subject of a rescue excavation by Hank Sopenistin and yielded dates around 1,660 years BP. An anthropological study was carried out on a few tombs showing burials of individuals lying on their backs with their news raised in tombs with offerings in the form of ceramics, copper ornament, and or iron weapons. But let us return to Langspin. Already in 2009, isolated and fragmented remains of human bones were found in the first level of the, of the excavation. According to the anatomical arrangement of the bones, according to their size and anatomical position, this corresponds to nine different individuals. The question therefore arose as to whether Langspin was a burial site. In 2010, the second year of the excavation, a first burial appeared at the excavation. Although it was disturbed, it provided a lot of information the sex and stature of the individual were revealed, as well as its direct radiocarbon dating. The date is 3,310 years BP. The burial was studied according to the approach of archaeotanatology. The aim of archaeotanatology or field anthropology is to identify the way of life of past populations. To do this, the analysis that is carried out takes into account the mode of decomposition of the flesh to explain the differences between the state observed during excavation and the initial position of the burial. The restitution of the initial position makes it possible to approach the intention and practices of the populations of the past. This method of investigation uses the interpretation of archaeological facts to reconstruct past practices by taking into account the filter of the decay of the flesh and the events that occur in the grave over the time. This approach has existed since the, six, the 70s in France and has been more widely disseminated since 2009, thanks to Henri Dudet's book wrote in English. So at Long Spin, we have some fragment piece of bone, but as I said, uh, we have a first tomb discovered in 2010. And at this occasion, two years after, Cécile and Roland Moura returned to John Hoyce to visit the king. Here are the steps in the reconstruction of the initial position following the archaeotanatological study of burial I-31. So here is the probable position of the individual in his grave according to the analysis. 
the individual is buried on his back, news raised with a pottery and a turtle shell under his legs. And at his side, five pots around the upper part of the body and the canid tooth amulet. So this is the grave when the flesh decays. Here, you can see that the grave has been opened. Bones from the left side of the individual are found on the right and vice versa. The skull appears to have been removed. The grave was then closed with a large limestone block being placed on the top of the individual. And the mandible was then placed on the limestone block. So the film can be wound up. So this first burial has been directly dated by radiocarbon, by the White Capo Waikato Lab Laboratory. And you can see here that where what are the restored pottery and the objects present in this grave. In the following years, new burials were uncovered, excavated by the team with Cambodian student. And here another case, the grave P31 which confirmed the conclusion of the previous archaeotanalogical study of the first grave. This individual was in a smaller pit, but as we can see, the news were raised. However, there was no offering in this grave. Sexing and stature were identified, and the individual was directly dated by carbon-14. Particular observation of the school showed a dental avulsion. The other burials show this characteristic, same position, same practice on B27, but with funerary offering. Also on D27, it is noted here that the grave is much more richly endowed with beads, rings, and pottery. An identical pattern for the, for the female grave is 32, Ah, sorry. Okay, here you can see a close-up of the dental evolution of this individual. Grave AA26 is another female grave. On the first reading, the individual appears to be buried differently from the others, but on the basis of the anatomical position of some bones, it appears that there was a sideways tilt of the whole body from an initial position quite identical to that of the other individuals. On the back, news up with a pot under the legs. To date, the excavation at Langspin have revealed the presence of six Neolithic burials whose direct datings are around 3,350 years BP. In the end, this is the case. Longspin Cave appears to have been a Neolithic burial cave. So studies are continuing, but I would like to, to, to conclude my speech with an open-ended reflection. Archaeotanatological shows that despite the sometimes different appearance, the burial of individuals on their back with their new raised on their, and their body surrounded by various offerings is a practice that has lasted for several centuries in Cambodia. Of course, such observations should be a look around in foreign country area and according to different time, just to, to have an idea of the, the practice, their evolution and, and change during the time and, and the space. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Valerie, for uh, that uh, wonderful exploration of uh, Lang Spien. And also thank you for teaching us a new term, archaeotanatology, which I had not known. And you can read about in the conference proceedings that will come out later uh, this week. Um, okay. And I'm sure we'll have some questions for Valerie uh, after this session. Uh, now from uh, from Neolithic burials in Cambodia, we go to Bronze Age burials in uh, Thailand. Uh, and I would like to call upon our next speaker, uh, Ajahn Narupon Pangtong Chacharin uh, from Silpakorn University. Uh, 
Uh, he is interested in bioarchaeology, uh, and his latest research is in uh, the prehistoric burials uh, of uh, the people of Ban Gao. Uh, Ajahn Narupon worked with us uh, this year in SPAPA for the archaeological bones course that we conducted in the middle of the year. So you might see a familiar face. Uh, Ajahn Narupon, please. Uh, thank you very much, Noel. Can you share my screen, please? Uh, sorry, Kap. Good afternoon, uh, Noel. Uh, distinguished speaker and our participant uh, via this platform and on the Facebook page of the Samuel Spafa. First of all, I would like to thank to the Samuel Spafa Con 2021 uh, for our organization. It's really fantastic. Today, I and my colleagues, Kun Supermadu Skun, a professional level archaeologist from the Division of Archaeology, the second regional office of fine arts department in Supanburi. Rajan P. Venunan, a lecturer from the Department of Archaeology in Bakon University. Kun Sukanya Lerb Nitnan and Sriipon Thappenthai, both are graduate students from Simbakon University, and also a few archaeologists on the excavation at Ban Thapo in 2020. We would like to share the new information on the title of the Bonds at People of Ban Kao, a preliminary analysis of the human remains from Ban Tapo archaeological sites in Western Thailand. That's based on the results of the two excavation season in 2018 and 2020. I will start with this outline and follow in the conference proceeding paper and this presentation. We start with the location of the Ban Tapo and Ban Gao archaeological sites. And then we will talk about the archaeological background on the Ban Gao area. And then it's about the preliminary results on the archaeological profile for the discovered burials. Uh, observation, the paleopathological relation on bones and note on the mortuary practice. And then is a part of this discussion and conclusion. Bantapo is located in the Bantapo village, Bangao sub district, Mueang district, Kanchanaburi province, on the east side of the Tennis Slim Range, that is the natural border between Myanmar in the west and Thailand in the east. Also in the Mekong, Mekong Tachi River Basin in the western region of Thailand. In this region, we found many historic cave sites and the sites on the river plain, and that have been uh, occupied since the Hobinian culture to the metal age. An example of the nearby famous archaeological sites uh, is like Bandon Tapet, that excavated by uh, Ian Gower in the 80s, and Nong Nachawat. Uh, that is excavation by Ms. Suma Dongsukun, uh, and we found almost 200 burials now. Bantapo size is located on the Thales deposit from an Ogbo Lake of the Kranoi River, which had permanently changed its path and dry in the last 50 years. The boundary of the Bantapo is covering the former primary local school area in the east and some space of the local temple Wat Tapo in the west. Why Ban Kao Sai, which had been known in the report uh, that the Bang Sai and Lu Sai is far from the Ban Tapo, about 1.2 to 1.6 kilometers westward, and is located on the old terrace of the Kranoi River Tributary, like a uh, Huay Manglak and Huay Hin. Based on the previous prehistoric investigation specific in the Bangkok and the surrounding area, it began after the Van Hickelen found some stone tools along the Thai Burmese Way while he was a prisoner of war in the Second World War. That led to the joint Thailandese prehistoric expedition conducted in 1960 
to 1962. They discovered a Paleolithic to Neolithic limestone cave and luxury sites along the Kwe Noi and Kwe Yai River, like Chande Cave, Bongba Cave, and Sayo Cave. Importantly, they discovered the famous Neolithic culture at Bangkok with its material culture, which had been known the Thai pot vessel had this process in the West Central region and also the Malay Peninsula. It was the first systematic archaeological equation in prehistoric Thailand. After that, in 1977 to 1981, Professor Sulin Pukachan and his colleague from the Department of Archaeology, Sinbakon University, conducted the research project on the archaeological investigation on the late Hobinian to Neolithic culture cave sites within the Bangkok area. They acquired some famous sites like the Kautalu Cave, Men Cave, and dating to about 5,000 before Persian. Next, in 2007 and 2010, Papit Pongmat and her colleagues from the Fire Art Department and also the staff from the Department of Archaeology in Bakon University began the research project that study on the relation on the Thai port vessel between Thailand and other Southeast Asian countries. This project equated some test fits within the Bangkok National Museum area. Not worry, really, since 1960, there have, been, there have been more archaeological investigation research projects in Western region in Thailand that led by the Thai and foreigner scholar. Nevertheless, before we found the Bantha Posai, there has no lack of the bronze pieces of evidence. And this is the missing period that we have not found. Or actually, this is the limitation of the TA technological concept that did not fit in this region, that unlike in central or not in eastern Thailand. That is the main topic that argued by the main scholar, like Ian Gover in 1991 and Pochano Kanjana in 2020. However, in 2016, the staff from the uh, Telephone Organization of Thailand accidentally found some pottery fragment while setting up a cell tower uh, at the Bantapo. It's continued the second national office of fire department sustainably conducted a systematic rescue equation from 2018 to the present that led by Superman Dunskun. The project aims to investigate the new archaeological evidence and assembly the development planning, the new action area of the Bangkok National Museum, where it's renovating. And in May to June 2018, the staff from the Department of Archaeology, Simbako University, in collaboration with the Regional Office of Fine Arts Panbury, conducted an annual archaeological field school there to train our bachelor and graduate student in archaeology. The project led by Chan P. Venunan. According to the excavation season in 2000, uh, in 2018 and 2020, at least 13 builders, 17 builders discovered with the various type of cave goods, such as earthen vessels, bone tools, Polish axe, and a significantly bone socket axe. Uh, you will see the left image in the east area of the site, showing the local, uh, showing the abandoned building of the local private school and the playground, and the light image is the west in the west area uh, showing the local shy and the place or the tapis number one where the staff of the thailand uh, organization uh, telephone organization of thailand accidentally found a piece of evidence and this site has been excavated in 2018. continuously these are the google earth for satellite imagery in 2021 and the equation plan of the bantha boat you will see the variety of the color. Green means to the equation head pit that run by the second original of it in 2018. And red is a head pit in 2020. They take a, a random sampling technique equation 
to develop planning for use this area as the extent area of the national bank that is today here. And the yellow uh, is the pit that excavated by the Department of Archaeology. And in earlier in this year, uh, Bantapo still has uh, the excavation and they have uncovered uh, more borders, but this something are uh, not, uh, not including in this study. As I mentioned before, we found at least 17 builders and had found, most had found in the southwest area of the local school. Using the kernel the seaport like this map, we found that the densest place of this material is closer to the, uh, to the bank of the old river. That means more, more density is more close, closer to the, the bank of the river. For the archaeological data, these human remains were examined with the standard microscopic method to estimate the age at death, like the dental development and bone development and growth, and estimation sec uh, from the skull and pelvic morphological tail. Including the observation of the paleopathology relation on their bones. About 13 individuals, or uh, 76.5%, were estimated that age at death at the subadult. And the more age classes are uh, infant, about uh, in uh, perinatal to three years old, and shy about three years to 12 years old. Unfortunately, due to their poor condition, two adults cannot determine their sex and two individuals found only the pieces of the long bone fragmentary. About the paleopathological relation that appear on these human remains, we found only two individuals, about 11.8% uh, showing some relation. The first one is the burden number two, a child skeleton. They have a parallel steel inflammation or the parallel cytos on the anterior proximal mid-sharp of the light humerus. This tail is a non-specific relation that is a reasonably common finding in prehistoric population and may caused by the trauma state or the infection. The other correlation is on the level cloud surface of the light maxima, maxillary, this is that canine, that is possibly related to the localized in a male hypoplasia and indicate to the maternal state when they are in Uthero. Yes, you will see this one. This one is the callus lesion that link to the local animal and the male hypoplasia. And this one is the new bone growth uh, on the same bone surface that is linked to the pylostitis. It uh, may be the Periosteal inflammation. The other is the shy bullet number five, a seven to eight years old. They build up with the bow legs and far with the turtle cut base, let or let above the groin. That is a politic hyperlostal situation on the ectokernal surface of the frontal and the parietals. It is non-specific lesson that indicate to the physiological state and link with the various condition, including anemia, infection, and vitamin deficiency. Also, on the left femoral mid-sharp, there is more curvature than usual, and there is a shallow fossa on the anterior surface of the femoral neck. That's related to the groove on the sacral iliac uh, choice on the left ilium that is deeper and more unusual, affected the shape of and morphology of the pelvis. And this one is the porous bone on the frontal. And this one is the uh, femur. You will see the mid sharp of the left femur is more bowing when compared with the left femur. And on the next of the uh, mid sharp, you will see some, some shallow. Uh, sulcus that relate to the deeper group, deeper group in the uh, sarcoiliac joint of the ilium that uh, normally they did not more deeper like this. 
uh, of this affected bone uh, indicated now uh, to the metallic bone diseases and possibly osteomalacia or vitamin D or some nutritional deficiency that will easily require an in-depth diagnosis later. According to the mortuary practice, all of them were primarily built in the supine position and with what a type of gap goes above their head, above and under their body or legs. Some videos appeared evident that the disease was bound at the ankle and possibly our body with some causes or textile, like the dead ritual that we found in the present day for the Buddhist, uh, for the Buddhist Thai. And you will see that all the in fact, all the video from the test is one and uh, the pit that excavated by the, by the Department of Agriculture. The video were laid on the north, uh, west to southeast direction. And both are the infant and children. It revealed that the ones people there probably divided that specific space for each family, hand, or group of each class. Furthermore, we can conclude some facts and note on the ritual that follow. The mortuary practice, the video was found either in the cemetery or the occupation uh, or habitation area. Most gap led down in the northwest to southeast direction. And no evidence suggests that the border orientation is related to that age and sex. And three of them, about 18%, uh, were found in associated with the bond socket act, both the uh, infant and children and adult. And we get some note about their mortuary practice, like this one. Uh, in the first season, there are only 10 infant to adolescent birders were uncovered that said that they might divide a specific area for the student cemetery. Uh, so from other schools state that they may be like a student cemetery or uh, the metal ish uh, at the Bangkok. And this site is unlike the other historic site in West Central and Northeastern Thailand, where some infants were buried in the village yard. The absolute carbon 14 M is dating from the cargo on this side is about 3,000 uh, and 80 to 2,950 before placing that step to the uh, bonds yet when we use the uh, pistol currency of Thailand. In conclusion, there are the various topics on this title for discussion. Anyway, I pick up the only two main issue that I am interested and have a plan to do more research in the future. Firstly, the results of fully, fully supported the bond's edge, occupation and settlement, fulfilling the peaceful ecology based on the technological development in Western Thailand. Secondly, when we compare with the other peaceful sites in the Mekong Pranoi River Basin, like Ban Lung Sum, uh, Ban Nam Dang, uh, the, the south area of the Passat Mun Sing. There is no shed of the evidence of the adventure world tradition. And mostly world in the Western Age led down on the north west southeast direction. Another one is the Ban Tha Pavilion were discovered either in the cemetery area or the occupation uh, habitation area. And the pattern of the student mostly caster, caster indicate to the separate space for a specific or diverse social group. All this evidence support to the concept of the integrating the issue with their belief and society. Later, we found uh, some of the evidence in the resident burial, residential burial in the western edge in the other side in Thailand. And thirdly, the total amount of infant and student burials and the ratio of the sub adults with adults were higher than usual. It's as well as the Copadom DP historic population. That is very different from those historic population in Thailand. And two, it out about 11.8% uh, far with the metallic 
bone disease population is similar to the about 16.7% uh, of ban gao individuals who has an extreme scar thickness caused by hemoglobin E or the continuity hemolytic anemia. That means uh, they have got the problem about some of the metallic bone disease caused by state or the nutrition uh, efficiency. It may be the limitation of the environment that then and that is happened since the old age to the metal age. And of course, all the data and the pathological pathological population suggests that the this uh, banta population they have the general poor health. However, all of this data can miss in the place, possibly related to the limitation of the random sampling equation area that we would uh, like more analysis on more study in the future. I am, finally, my colleagues and I would like to send a sincere thanks to this organization and communities. And I would like to promote the Bangkok National Museum. Recently, they have finished the renovated and unofficially open. So if you have a chance to visit Thailand and Kajanakuli province, please do not miss that. Thank you very much for all of your attention. Thank you, Ajahn Narupon, for that presentation. And yes, I do plan to visit the Bangkok National Museum next year. Um, for our final speaker this uh, session, I would like to introduce our speaker, Professor Elizabeth Moore, who almost doesn't need an introduction by herself. She is Professor Emeritus of uh, SOAS, Department of History and Arch uh, and Archaeology, and also uh, an Associate Fellow at the ICS Yusof Ishtak uh, Institute. And uh, this, this afternoon, well, this morning for uh, Professor Elizabeth, is uh, she will be talking about the Mount Popa watershed and the Bronze Iron Age of Bagan. And we are going to play your video, is that correct? Yes, go ahead and play the video and all. All right. And then Make we'll sure I remember that what I was thinking about. <laughs> well, we'll come back to the questions and answers okay. after this session. Hello, good morning all. Thank you very much for including this presentation. I'd like to talk to you today about Mount Popa and Pagan's Bronze Iron Age. I'll go ahead and proceed. Last year, two finds were made near Weilong. You see here, this site here, north of Mount Popa and northeast of Pagan. It's also about 30 kilometers from this site here, Malang, where the first mother goddess figure was found in 1998. I'll come back to these areas again. I'd like to say a bit more about Mount Popa far more than gnats and very significant, I think, in looking at the geology and their resources. It's an isolated cone, about 1500 meters east of Pagan. Geologically, it's part of the Bogo Yoma to the south that includes the Singutara Hill on which the Shwedagon Pagoda is located. So a, an auspicious Yoma. Its early habitation includes many significant finds, stone artifacts from silicified top and lavas of the Chakpadong Hills that are here immediately southwest of Popa. Geologically, it dates to the late Cenozoic. The finds that were made at Weilong included two mother goddess figures. These figures are distinct in being slim, headless, um, no head apparent, with the breasts and womb and backbone highlighted. They have been, in most cases, although none of these have been documented through stratigraphic excavation, been found with the legs bent over the knee and reversed so that the legs are over the head and the upper body over the pelvis. On some, the two included that I've included here in these drawings by Uwin Mong, um, include a double pointed axe that was found in an earlier culture in the Chinduin Valley that I'll mention near the end. Many, many mother goddess figures, I believe, have been lost through bead hunting. Bead hunting is not a new phenomenon in, in Myanmar. 
um, but has but occurred since the 1920s. And quite remarkably, um, it's in, in search of these beads and destruction of virtually all else within the graves, they're not yet depleted with new discoveries and looting, particularly in the area of Sugu and Maguey, um, continuing and circulated on social media. So that telling a, an authentic ancient bead from an imitation one has now become quite difficult. The reason I believe these finds at Weilong, um, which is just here and along this red line, is that it opens up a new line of interchange between central Myanmar and Yunnan in the late first millennium CE in the early centuries AD. First millennium BCE into CE. Previously, all the mother goddess figures have been found along this river valley here, south of Mandalay, the Samoan River Valley, with some finds found in Halin. The sites I'm talking about here, Popa, raise the possibility of an interchange route that would have gone north to um, Pakanji, to Halin, up to Tagong, and possibly over by Abamo to, to Musei, whereas previous finds would have been here along this, this river valley and route, again to the northeast. But many, many of the finds and the most significant ones, I believe, are those locally found only. To date, they've not been found outside central Mamma, not in other parts of the countries and not in, in neighboring countries. The mother goddess figures include bronze packets, jaydok, many of which I think imitate or are in a similar form to wet rice agriculture you see here in the Simone and, and also up in the Halin and Shwebo valleys today where the, the rice packets are bundled. So possibly indicators of wealth and early wet rice agriculture. The mother goddess figures in a postulation made by Tampawadiu and Mong may also address a gap in the understanding of the relationship between the prehistoric cultures of both the Simon and Popa Aries and the early Pew historic cultures, which were certainly part of the beginnings of Pagan. What Seu and Mong has identified here are in particular the emphasis on the collarbone here and the breasts and the womb and the possibility within a regenerative context that they recur again in the symbolism of the Srivasta. It's a postulation, but useful in trying to address this very important gap. In contrast to the locally made bronzes are imported ceremonial ones that are very typical of the Dion cultures of Yunnan. Notably, the Hager type one bronze drums here that you see that do have some dating that I'll come back to at the end of my presentation. To return to the local, the geological context, um, the Simone River Valley is very short. It drains here north into the Aowadi, whereas the Mount Popo watershed is here connected directly to the Aowadi, but along small streams such as the Sindewa stream here. So two quite distinct hydrological areas that I think were important in terms of ancient interchange patterns. In placing such emphasis on the prehistoric to early historic region of Mount Popa, I just like to note that the historicity of the Popa Nat tradition, the spirit tradition, which is one of the prevalent characteristics by which it's known today, has been queried. Yule was not able to reach the top. He called it inaccessible, but he did indeed include a sketch profile here that shows this plug-like area of Tongkalat, which is where the Nat veneration is. My point including here is that it's within this natural setting that the Nat and later Waysa traditions of whatever date developed, stretching back to the Chocolithic and bronze iron cultures from which or where few settlements seemed possibly to have later arisen. The burials at Weilong are probably a 
high copper bronze. They've not yet been tested. They included two single bodied mother goddess figures where you see, as I mentioned earlier, the legs were bent. They also included low repousse roundels, elongated bells that you see here, um, and cylindrical bells. Flat swords that were laid near the surface, perhaps just over a disintegrated wooden coffin. And the mother goddess figure was on the very top um, with floral elements set along the sides. Also found in the area, which again brings back the sense of connections to Yunnan and, and Southwest China are some indications of bronze mirrors such as these. None have come up again through stratified excavations, but they are known within the Han dynasties of the late BCE to early CE. I'd like to mention just a few of the sites that have come up here along the, in the Mount Popo watershed, none of which have been rigorously excavated. So I rely on earlier data. This is from a 1990s survey where three different areas were identified. One was stone implements on the south, bronzes in the middle and near the present village, iron. So a seeming sequence over time at this one site. I should also mention that there were armor and plates, possibly remnants of mother goddess figures that had been destroyed that were found at Inde. Another site is Songon here to the south near Mount Popa. You can see way along here and Inde here and some of the early first millennium CE sites of Pagan over here. Also it's geological context here. Songon yielded quite a number of important artifacts. These found in 2009, a long bronze ax, similar to that of the Nyongan Cemetery at Budlin in the Chinduan River Valley, and a very well-made, simply made coiled pot found in 2009 survey as well by Uwin Chine. This pot and the bronze implement are quite different from the context that Uwin Mong Temple, what do Uwin Mong found in 2003? He found beautifully made, um, very fine pedestal jars, some of which had two holes on the bottom, a range of different vessels. So a seeming sequence again over time, undated, but, but notably distinct. The final site that I'd like to mention is Sardwinji that I visited last June where the artifacts that were found and recorded in the 1990s are now gone, but the salt beds that you see here and the iron furnaces are intact. Also on the slopes of Popa, on the slopes of the mountain are a number of monasteries, the largest um, Sachinpia, recalling the salt deposits. All of these sites appear to have not well excavated, but documented finds that show continuous habitation since late Neolithic times, but yet they have not yet been factored into the chronology of Pagan, nor have they been related well, I think, to the prehistoric record around the Samoan and its links to Yunnan, which is quite unique within the region. These of course bring up dating issues. Within the Chinduin Valley that I mentioned earlier, there's been stratified excavation by Ali Price and his team um, that goes from over many, many centuries into the sixth century BCE, but without an onward transition into the Iron Age, so distinct from what I'm talking about here. In the Simone Valley to the east, the chronology runs from roughly 600 BCE to 400 to 300 CE <clears throat> with the high copper bronze mother goddess figures not yet dated. Thus they could be mid second millennium BCE, but they could equally be early historic with a possible overlap with the chronicle chronology of early Pagan. If we look back to Mount Popa, again, the, the Simone Valley here, this small brown area, 
is considered a distinctive culture. But indeed, this in within this yellow area here, the Popo watershed, we have similar artifacts and artifacts of earlier eras. So it would seem a longer habitation sequence that is significant in relationship to both earlier and later periods. If I just briefly introduce a complex and not well documented and not believed by a lot of archeologists, chronology within chronicle chronology of early Pagan, it runs from about 107 CE up until the fourth century. Within this, we see a city built and then we see a city dissolved. So little more explanation than that and not yet satisfactory excavation of the supposed city areas. But what we do have is a sequence within the early century CE that are linked to resource exploitation. And in my belief, this and all of the events in here, which they're not, of course, within Chronicles, may well have been intimately linked to resource exploration, exploitation and exploration um, east of Duyintong and around Mount Popa. I can't do any more than that because there's been no more evidence, but this area needs to be remembered in trying to look at Pagan. Come back to the question of chronologies within some of the bronzes that have been documented within Mama. One includes a wine java, wine jiba, excuse my pronunciation drum, and the other shishai shan, these types A and B, typical of the warring states period. So well into the BCE era, not the early historic era. But if the mother goddess predates the this the early historic period, there was then of course already habitation when the pew arrived. If it postdates, then it raises questions, I believe, of the ethnic, so-called ethnic identity of the Tibeto-Burman group. Thus, the Simone culture may not, as I indeed have published, been an offshoot of the Dion cultures of Yunnan but an indigenous development spreading east and north while locally absorbed within the early first millennium CE clan-based societies of, Mam of Pagan. Mount Popa is the one pivot within this from the prehistoric to the early historic era. The origins and trajectory of Samoan societies, the early first millennium BCE to the first half of the First millennium CE, within this trajectory, the narrative shifts from place to place, but Popa, with its resources, is the sole recurring location. Within the early chronicles, we have a tutelary and military guise to the area that, again, is consistent from the prehistoric to the early historic eras. So my aim here, I can't yet date, but I, I will not forget this, and it will continue, um, is to at least bring Popa into the picture, both of Pagan and of the late prehistoric period of central Myanmar. Thank you very much, and thank you for including this. My thanks particularly to Noel Tan and the Spafa Khan team who have done an admirable job in organizing this conference. Within Myanmar, say Uwin Mong Tampawadi and Uwin Chine in Pie. At Pagan, in particular, some of my SOAS Alphawood alumni, Think Thane Ong and Yamin Te, assisted also by Pio Wei. At Pagan, Une La Win U, who, along with his companion, was invaluable in taking us to some of the sites last June. All errors and my speculations here, of course, remain my own responsibility. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Elizabeth, um, for that interesting uh, paper on the bronze mother goddess figures of the Samoan Valley. Um, can I call upon all our speakers for this session to uh, turn on their videos and we shall do the obligatory uh,
All right, thank you very much. Okay, so let's get on with the questions and answer session. We got a we got a, a good time uh, ahead of us, about half an hour. Uh, I encourage uh, any of you uh, who are listening in on uh, Facebook or on Zoom to to just uh, send in your questions so that we can get through as many as as possible. So we have a couple of questions for Valerie. Uh, so let's let's start with that. Uh, one from uh, one from Maria Andre Palom. Um, she asks uh, for the for the side and lung spin. And I know this is true. Um, are there any stone tools that were recovered, and what were the stone tools uh, for? And how do we? Uh, um, all right, so. Number one, are there stone tools? What they were for? Uh, and what was the position of buried bones and how can we interpret them for our, uh, how do we interpret the burial practices? Okay, so uh, let's say that uh, we have stone in the very old la layer, about 70,000 70, year old, but the, the main uh, material is coming from the Oabinian layer which is between 11,000 and 5,000 year old BP. And so we have about 30, uh, uh, three or 4,000 stone tool for Oabinian period. Well, also uh, 12,000 remain of uh, animal bones. And um, what's happened is that the cover is, it's, um, the cover, cover layer is uh, Neolithic. But it's because it's burial, as you can imagine, when people uh, make dig the, 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 the ground to make the burial, they remove a little the material. So that's why you have to take care from material which was uh, from older layer that can be re removed in the, in, the, in the burial when you, you close it. So if you speak about uh, animal bone, it's mainly on Oabinian. If you talk about uh, human bone, it's mainly in burial, but as uh, some burial can cut other burial, and as I show you, some burial are disturbed. It seems that there is some practice. So first of all, I thought that maybe there is some looting in the, in the first burial we, we discovered, but after uh, reflection, and after looking some example of uh, burial uh, dated about 3000 BP in Vanuatu, we have such a practice to, re to open the burial, to make something and to recover the burial. So today I cannot say if it's a practice or if it's looting of the burial. So that's the point. So that's the question that should be answered in the near future, I hope. It would be interesting if we if we have evidence for prehistoric uh, looting. Uh, well, well, I'm not sure if it's prehistoric looting or if it's, if it's prehistoric practices. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. Uh, so, for uh, on on a related note, uh, Suri Ratana has a question about the seventy-one thousand year old. Uh, you mentioned stone tools, or but she mentioned uh, she talks about. 71,000 bone fragments. I'm, I'm not sure whether, whether there's a 71,000 date somewhere. And, and I don't know whether- uh, that Sorry, sir, what does it mean? Stone tools. The stone tools, well, yeah, the stone tools are from, from Oabinian. So between 11,000 and, and 5,000. And there's only few um, material associated to the burial. With, and this is a, a little ads. So it's Neolithic material, but also sometimes there is a still, um, uh, I would say that, well, it's not unifest, it's like, it's, like, um, it's more adds than adds, uh, which is uh, partially polished, like in the Baxonian, that is not, well, according to the date, it's not Baxonian, but it's, it's, it seems to be the same practice, the same use of the, the same way to make the, the stone tool. What about the older material, the, uh, the 71, the 70,000 year old, uh, ah, so it, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very raw material, but it's for sure, according to the analysis, it's, 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 it was a uh, by, by human. So that's the question. 
Uh, so it means that we, we may have a very old occupation of, of this cave. So, but the work is still working on. So we, we, we expect to get more information about that, this older layer. Uh, moreover, uh, this layer is quite, quite contemporaneous with the, you know, the Toba event. So that's another point. It's, it could be very important information for continental prehistory. Uh, what do you think are the potential to find other uh, cave burials in Cambodia? Well, uh, it, 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 well, in Long Spring, there is several caves, but they are more or, le more or less disturbed by the monk activity, the, more, the recent monk activity. So it's the same everywhere, as you know, in Southeast Asia. So uh, the problem is to get access to the, to the cave. And as, as I told, there's minefield all around. So that's the problem to make survey in, in Cambodia, in some part of Cambodia. And there is not that much uh, mountain. We have mountain in the western part of Cambodia, from the north to about Pat, or on the Pat, uh, Batambang area to the Cardamon. Not that much in the other part of Cambodia. But the question has to be asked to a uh, country all around, Filipina, Thailand, everywhere. So it's just the beginning of the work. So, and the question of the, the burial cave was just a, well, not a joke, but just a question like this, because we don't need to, to, to have caves to have some cemeteries. So the question was, can we compare cemeteries like we have in, so, in uh, Northeast Thailand and, and, and in the cave? So and also there is still the question to, of the preservation of the, of the site which is more easy in, in cave than in open field. All right. Um, I'm going to go to a question from uh, Mark. Um, and this is probably a question that I'll pose to both you, Valerie, and to Ajahn Narupon. Based on uh, the evidence that you've presented, how do you characterize the burial practices? Were the, were the societies more hierarchical? or stratified or more communal. So uh, let's start with Narupon first and then I'll go to Valerie. Uh, yes, when we talk about uh, the social status or the hierarchy on the hierarchy on the blanket of the border practice, we study from the, the, the pattern, uh, the, the mortuary practice and the type of the uh, values of the cave goods. So we use all of that to, to calculate and uh, estimate it for their social status to make it for some, uh, some uh, social rank. Uh, the other, we use the uh, uh, area for uh, the, the mortuary pattern and the area for to, to build the, the disease to use to divide of the form the edit to the lower caste or anything else. But anything, anyway, we did not have uh, the history the court like in the historical uh, period. But we use all of the, the, the archaeological evidence that we found to test this and describe it. And of course, in the future, if we have the more theory or more concept to test about that, so uh, some story will change it up onto the, the the, the practice. I have a follow up question for you, Ajahn Narapan, but uh, I'll go to Valerie first for his response. Okay, so I think this question is not so, so simple because uh, we, we used to, to make some analogy between archaeology and ethnography or anthropology, social anthropology. And I'm, I'm not sure that the analogy is, is, is the good thing. I'm not that sure. Uh, what, what we can say is that there is a similarity or differences between different burial in the same place or different uh, funerary place in different place and also through the time. But I, I think it's complicated. I think it's just, um, let's say, uh, interpretation. Uh, if you make some iron or some bronze or metallic or whatever, you need to make a structure in the society because everybody cannot make the, the same thing. But it's, 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 it should be the same for the stone tool. Maybe all of the people are not able to make stone tool. So, so what does it mean? Does it mean that there's a, some speciality in the activity between different parts of the society, between male and female? 
uh, what about the implication of the children or not? So I think it's difficult to answer the question of, of, of uh, hierarchy. And also it's mainly based on the, the richness of the burial, but what is the meaning of richness? Uh, we have some sample in the Pacific with uh, many uh, burial with a lot of offering all around one central uh, tomb with nothing. But uh, it's just because uh, maybe the, the big man used some uh, weather or very nice clothes with a perishable uh, material. So we can have, we can have uh, catch it in terms of archeology, span but so it means that uh, maybe if you have nothing, maybe it's very important because it just means that we have no, nothing more in the burial, but it doesn't mean that in the beginning that there is nothing. So that, that's the, the question of the value of the, of the different artifact. And sometimes we used to project our own modern point of view. Maybe it was not the same in the past. <laughs> so, so by your story is that there is a, no answer. <laughs> That's a good point that we should all always remember when we are interpreting whatever we find. Um, it's a good thing that you mentioned uh, children and burial practices because that, that goes to my question that I was going to ask Ajahn Naruton, um, which is given what you've seen in uh, Bantapo with the very distinct uh, infant burials as opposed to the other burials in, in the region in Bantau, uh, do you think that that uh, they constitute like a different people or a different culture altogether? Is it fair to call them uh, uh, a ban kao culture still? Uh, uh, when we compare with the ban kao culture, the meaning of ban kao culture just means to the Neolithic that we found the Thai part vessels. <laughs> but we, when we say to the ban tapo, it is the sign that we team in the area of ban kao. And we did not have, uh, 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 based on the previous uh, cultural equation, uh, we did not find any the continuous uh, of the Bankau from Neolithic. Based on the equation of the, in 1960, they found the Neolithic layer and the metal edge layer, only two burials in the metal, but we missed some of the bonds as village. And uh, many scholars believe that they did not fit with this region. But back to your question, I believe this is the same group of the people. I think it may be because they, uh, based on this, our result, we found that uh, there are some, some people who got uh, some poor health. And in this case, if you back to the Bangkok report, and this is that report by the Sangvishian, you will see that uh, many of the uh, adult burial deaths maybe uh, got uh, some anemia and some, some anemia, this is uh, inherited to, uh, to, to the, the descendant to the young generation. And in this Bantapo, we found uh, many of the children and infants died. Maybe in, uh, based on the clinical study, we found that if some infant or children, they caught uh, the anemia, they will have a high mortality rate. But anyway, in the future, if you would like to confirm about that, we would like to test the ancient DNA. This is a scientific uh, empirical data to, to answer about this question. Thank you, Ajahn Arapon. Um, I want to, oh, Valerie has a comment. Yeah, I just would like to, to say to everybody something that you have to notice. Uh, if you consider paleo demography, you have to consider that uh, if you have 100 uh, people die, uh, half, half of the population is less than one year old. This is just normal be for this whole period be before the vaccination. So that, that, that's, the, that's the way. And the other point that, that uh, Nari Paul speak about in his speech is that uh, if you have only a part of the, of the, of the cemetery, it's difficult to, to say something because uh, one of the question is, are the children buried with all the other, or did they have a, a specific treatment elsewhere or in a part of the cemetery? And according to the, the, the area that you can investigate, you cannot answer the question. So the first thing is to be able to, to know what is the boundary of the cemetery before to make some questioning about the, the question of the children. That, that, that's the point. 
And, uh, and after the question is, are they buried in the same way with the adult or not? And the question of the pathology, of course, is, uh, has to be uh, investigated with uh, the new tool we have from genetic or whatever. But sometimes it's difficult because due to the preservation of the bone, there is no answer also like that. So of course we have anthropologists who can speak about the anatomy without genetics, so we are safe. <laughs> All right, thank you for your comments. Uh, I'm gonna move away from bones now. I'm gonna segue to our colleagues uh, uh, in Japan, uh, to uni. I, I, I think we, we take for granted well, I take for granted that I know I know what Western Prasad top is. Uh, I'm I'm not sure that uh, most of our audience is, is uh, familiar with the the work, the long running work at Western Prasad top. I was wondering if Uni and uh, 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 Tamura, if you could tell us a little bit more about your work at uh, Western Prasad top and the restoration there. All right, uh, thank you for your um, question or comment. And then the, our, we, our institute uh, cooperated with the Uppsala National Authority and we started our uh, research project in 2002 with Uppsala. And then uh, from 2011, uh, we started the restoration project of the Western Prasa Top. Uh, in Angkor Thom. And then we uh, restore the temple structure itself. Uh, but at the same time, we have conducted the archaeological or architectural and conservation science research also. So, and then we could find, uh, find the uh, lots of the new evidences from our excavation. So today we could uh, summarize summarize uh, our result, uh, preliminary result. And um, yes, thank you. Is it okay? <laughs> well, besides glass, what else have you found? Yes. <laughs> uh, what, what else other than glass have you found in, uh, in your years working there? Once again, please. Besides glass, Mm -hmm. what, what other things have you found at uh, during your work at uh, the Western Passat Top? Besides the grass. <laughs> uh, we found a lot of uh, artifacts, uh, including the Buddhist artifacts, like the sculptures, uh, of course, ceramics, and also the uh, metal objects. Mm -hmm. Uh, some from the Buddhist uh, from the Buddhist excavation, but the uh, from the surrounding area also uh, we could uh, find uh, those artifacts. Uh, how long more do you expect to work at the uh, at that particular at, uh, Western Passat Top? Uh, I hope that the, our restoration project will be completed uh, early next year. Uh, but the, unfortunately, because of COVID, uh, we Japanese cannot uh, go to the same lab. But uh, I, uh, thanks to them, our Cambodian colleague, uh, they uh, proceed their uh, restoration work. So probably our restoration project will be uh, done on early next year, but uh, we will continue the, our uh, research, uh, academic research at Western Prasato and the surrounding area, at least Thank in you. five years. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I look forward to hearing more about you. I, I, I've I've always been receiving your report, so it's always good to see the evolution of the work over there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and finally, I've got questions for Professor Elizabeth. Um, I'm saving the best for last. Uh, I, I had a question for Uni too as well. Can I ask Uni a question? Yes, go ahead. Yes. Um, Uni, I think, I think the long-term NARA engagement 
is truly admirable. I mean, you go and you excavate and then you analyze, you, you take things over time. Will you, do you hope next year to perhaps try to publish electronically as well as in hard copy, a, um, a comprehensive study of the area with all those different artifacts? I, I had been aware of the, the glass finds, but, but bringing it all together is, is wonderful. Really, yes, so hope, hoping for more. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, we have a plan to publish the, our final report of the, this process of uh, research and restoration project probably in five years. Uh, mm -hmm. So that the, please wait for uh, several years. <laughs> but uh, we, we hope that, that we can publish or write out some paper uh, about the, our findings from No Sanctuary and uh, first one will be uh, released on uh, yes the Absol Journal new Absol Journal probably but I'm not sure when it will be open but uh, yes okay. near future yep and and the beads can you try to compare the beads more to those that you got from Yama um, you started that study please please continue on the comparative yes, yes, one. Yes, of course, <laughs> I want to uh, analyze more PC okay. Myanmar. Yes. Great, thank you. I'm, I'm also going to shamelessly plug the Spapa Journal too. If you want to publish any of your work, the Spapa Journal is also available. To <laughs> All right. Uh, I, I'm jokes aside, um, I have a question for uh, Professor Elizabeth, uh, and this is from our senior Nicholas. Is going to be uh, is going to be talking on Thursday about um, the the um, the mus musicians in in the bar relief on Kowat. Um, she would like to know if from from you and from other presenters if you have found bells or round pellet bells in the excavations. Um, as these pellet bells have also been found in other burial sites in Thailand and in the Philippines. By the pellet bells, does he mean the, the round ones that have the small, that you, that make noise when you shake them? I, I assume so. And if uh, Arsenio yeah. can uh, mention in the chat, that would be good too. But yeah, I assume so. I actually didn't realize they'd been found in Thailand and the Philippines. I'd be interested to know where. And it, it just to note that it's, it's evidence which, which I mentioned in my presentation of the, the musical instruments seemingly to be imported, whereas the typical ritual goods are, are not. And it seemed to be, I have yet to, to hear of them being found outside central Myanmar. But yes, indeed, I, I don't know if those bells have been found in Cambodia, for example. Uh, what about our our friends in working in the prehistoric sites? Have we found evidence for 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 bells or similar instruments in in a prehistoric context? Yeah, yeah. Yes. So, uh, so, yes. Uh, in Thailand, in northeastern Thailand, we found that, that kind of the pellet belt, but I'm not sure that is uh, the music instrument. Uh, we have uh, two kinds at least. Well, first one is the small pellet there. Uh, we are found with the, some the leg or the hand or the men's ones, like a, like a children wear when they walk and they have got some noise. And the other bell that we found, that is uh, the cotton bell. This is a big bell. Uh, uh, hang at the allow the water uh, buffalo or the, the 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 cow to make its noise, and we found many of the the bronze bell and pellet bell in the northeastern in uh, the metal period, part in the uh, Iron Age, and also the Proto Prehistoric. I I had a question following up about bells for uh, Professor Elizabeth. Um, you showed that picture of the the bells, but they they look more like um, swords or daggers to me. Uh, how are they not like? Um, how they look more like what? Uh, swords or small daggers because they have a little tang. 
No, I the I could go back to the picture, but there were long swords. Yeah. But there's also some cylindrical bells. Oh, okay. All right. So I was looking at something else. And I, in the picture I showed, I did not show the round bells. Okay. Thank you. All right. So I was looking at something. I was, I was just probably just attracted to the weaponry. What I find extraordinary for the culture I presented is the the continuing appearance of beads. I, I find it it really makes the picture ambiguous because there are groups that are exchanging bead news constantly. And to presumably, these can't all be authentic. If they are, they represent a horrific continuing looting of, of ancient sites, um, which is totally uncontrolled across all of the region. But I don't think that's fully the extent. So presumably a lot of them are new. So it, it, it's something that's difficult to know how to control, but has really muddied the picture of trying to understand the ancient culture. Um, I that's understand. Interesting point. Uh, do, you, do you think beads could possibly be have recirculated over time as well? I mean, uh, they could have been as valuable then as they are now. And, and so I don't see any reason why they couldn't have been recirculated over and over. Yeah, yes, yes, maybe up. they're just recirculated indeed. Maybe maybe I shouldn't be thinking that they're looted sites every time I see these. Okay, that's hopeful, no. Okay, yes, thank hopefully you. Not. Yes. yes. No. Okay, uh, I think we've come to the... Uh, I don't know if there are any more questions. I don't see any other open questions. Uh, so I think I can uh, call this session to a close. So uh, let me once again thank all the, uh, all the participants for this session for your sharing and for your research. Uh, uh, and thank you for participating in SPAPACON 2021. Um, it, is, it is sad to not see each other in person, but I'm, I'm always happy to see everyone's faces uh, from so far away. Um, and I hope uh, you will join us. Oh, I hope to see you soon next year in Chiang Mai, hopefully, or sooner. And um, again, for our participants uh, near and far, please join us uh, tomorrow. Tomorrow, we will start at uh, 10 a.m. Bangkok time. Um, and we will, uh, tomorrow, I'm going to be I'm going to be uh, replaced by a prettier face than me. Uh, Dr. Hataya will take over the moderating duties tomorrow. So, you know, you might be tired of my face. Don't worry, we'll fix that. Um, so uh, we will see you tomorrow and uh, please uh, have a good evening, good afternoon and good morning. Okay, all right, thanks very much. Thank you. <laughs>